The Sustainable Voice, bringing you big successes from small places worldwide. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Sustainable Voice. Uh, I'm your host, Ashish, along with my co-host, uh, Lee. How's it going? Uh, going well, Ashish. Very well. I have to tell you a funny story. Uh, yes, this morning, actually. Oh, no, yesterday evening. My, my mother turned on YouTube. And she, she normally does to put on her music. And the first thing that popped up on YouTube, and this is kudos to our social media guys because they're good at their job. Uh, the first thing that popped up was our last episode, Beyond Cartagena. Yes. So she stopped and she said, I don't want nothing. I'm going to go anywhere. I'm going to listen to you. And then she came back and she said, wow. That she was liked weird. it. She liked it. She liked it. So I am trying to convince her to come to Colombia with me in May. Oh. Um, so yeah, her... Good. Her and my father were supposed to go last October. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to go this October. Uh, and that's what we're going to get into. Uh, yeah. But they, they didn't get to. So uh, the world changed. Um, as mm -hmm. you can see, I have a new haircut. Yeah, uh, I, I look very different. So I, I'd like to explain to our viewers and our listeners uh, what's happened. We are recording this podcast on May, March 29th. Uh, on March 16th, which is basically... Less than two weeks ago, my, my father passed away. Uh, he had uh, fallen, he had hit his head, uh, and he passed away peacefully um, on, on March 16th. So we had a, well, we had a schedule, a, a calendar for this episode. And yeah. as usual, I pretty much blew it to kingdom come uh, <laughs> because we're, 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 we're pretty much going off the rails and we're going to actually talk about that today. Good. Um, so, so, you know, this podcast, I remember when we started this podcast, uh, I had talked to him. He thought I was nuts. <laughs> and I said, Dad, this is, it was like the middle of the pandemic. He's like, we have other things to do. I'm like, no, you don't understand. We should do this. This is the time to do it. So we started <laughs> this podcast. And, and what he didn't know, and I probably should have told him, but I didn't tell him, was that he was the inspiration behind it, right? This podcast mm -hmm. is about big successes in small places. And there's no better success than him mm -hmm. because he came from irrelevance. He came from, you know, the, 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 the place that, that the people give up. Yeah. He came from, from a background that, that would make people cringe and he made something of himself mm -hmm. and, and, and he represents that. And then he's, he's actually helped people around the world. And I actually last night, because I had to deliver a speech tonight on, on his behalf, I counted how many lives he had touched between our foundation, between his personal projects. Just in the last 10 years, I just wanted to get a glimpse. I was shocked. Over 103,000 lives. And that's all that you can count. You don't even know the ripple out mm -hmm. beyond that, the 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 flapping of the wings that just that's right. keeps going. That's right. I, I mean, I, I look, I, I'm sure everybody says this, but I, I have the numbers to back it up. We're there. And you're right. The ripple effect, I could probably multiply that by 10. Mm -hmm, for uh, sure. and, and 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 the reason I wanted to do this episode about him was not because he passed away, right? I mean, that's that's a that's a, a part of life, um, and it's not something that we would want to happen. But it's part of life, and you know, as a true friend and co-host and and just somebody I trust, you saw me at my most vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. We were trying to record uh, while he was in the hospital, and it just wasn't happening. Um, and that was basically him saying no. No, not yet. And now yeah. the words are just flowing uh, right. in, in, term, in, term, in terms of how we're doing this. And I think that's that's special in, in terms of what we're doing. There, you know, when I remember, I, I, I remember telling about this podcast and then he started listening and where the podcast really just clicked with him was an episode we did about Sudan, about my uncle, mm. my mom's younger brother and leaving Sudan and what that was like and, and, and chronicling it. Uh, and he stopped and he said it to him and he saw, as you said, the ripple effect of my uncle watching it, of the rest of our, my mom's family watching it as they, as they had all left Sudan and stepping back saying, wow, this was articulating the story that we wanted to tell, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that was, that was the case. So it, 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 it was, I thought it was fitting that today we talk about him. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that he's done. And I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to do it. And I'll get to my new haircut in a second as well. I'll explain that. But I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to do it. However, he passed away March 16th at 2.45 in the morning. In the less than two weeks since he's passed, I have gotten probably close to a 1,000 
phone calls, emails, messages from people. None of them are saying, oh, he went too soon. Mm-hmm. He was 75. You know, he, he did go too soon. But none of them are saying he went too soon or it's this. They were all saying the same thing. Your father was my favorite. Wow. Your father did this for me. I am who I am because of your father. Your father did that. I One letter in particular was somebody that I had grown up with. His name is Sammy. And, and I, I think he watches this podcast. Uh, so if he is, he knows who he is. But I had grown up with him. You know, my, my father lost both of his parents before he was 20. Mm. And so there was a gentleman in our house. name was Rasto in Kenya. And he helped raise me as well while I was there. He has been with our family, had been with our family since my father was three years old. Uh, he was pretty much the only link, the real link that I had to my grandparents because I never met them. And he would tell me all the things that they would do in, in, in different ways. And he would make little comments. I used to sneak out of the house to go have ugali and sukuma, which is cornmeal and kill, a Kenyan dish with him and his, man, his family. And Sammy was his son. Yeah. So last year in Kenya, call it serendipity. I was at a hotel in Nairobi, just getting ready to come out. And all of a sudden, I get a call from, from my colleague saying, you need to come right now. There's somebody here to see you. And I'm thinking, maybe it's some client or something. It's Sammy. Oh. In the middle of the this hotel lobby. And I literally looked and I said, Sammy? And, she, and we hugged. We embraced. We started crying. And everybody's staring at us, wondering, wondering how we found each other. And he got to talk to my father. And he got to talk to him and it was, it was special, right? It was, it was very, very special because he got to actually see and he got to connect. And this is, I hadn't seen him since I was 12 years old. And we joke, you know, when we were younger kids, four or five, I was younger than him. So I was four or five years old. We'd climb the guava tree in the front and I would fall off and every time I get in trouble, it sometimes would be his fault, but I'd somehow take the fall for it every time. <laughs> Uh, which I, which is beyond me. And we were, we were joking about this ray, this uh, pedal car, this, you know, those little pedal cars that kids use. So in Nairobi, we'd burn our garbage. That was not the case. I mean, they still do it there. I threw the pedal car into the garbage. I just picked it up and threw it into the garbage. Uh, and, and I, and I thought, I thought it was absolutely hilarious because he said, do you remember when you did that? I go, you, I go, we, we did that together. You helped me lift the car in the garbage. Hold on a second. Um, so, <laughs> what was what was really cool was in the days since since uh, dad's passing and you know I, I i somebody told me i had a, a family a family member tell me about this he posted a letter thanking my father and he said that before he knew my father he was illiterate and mm-hmm. we're talking like 15 years old and illiterate wow my father gave him his first job taught him how to read and write put him through different schools. And now he speaks Italian. He speaks German. He speaks English. He speaks Swahili and he reads and writes in multiple languages. Wow. How's that for, how's that for a big success in a small place? That's a huge success. Were you aware of your dad's influence over on Sammy? Uh, I mean, and, and, and his, not to the, helping? N- not to the degree that Sammy mm-hmm. told me. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I remember Sammy mentioned to me, he said that when I went to other members that he could have asked help for, they all said, I'm not your father. Mm. And and my father is the one who took him in. Wow. And, and taught him and, and, and made him somebody doing transfers to the airport, then a tour guide and then everything else. And that's just, that's one of hundreds of cases, thousands of cases. I mentioned to you, 103,000 is the yeah. number. Uh, yeah. you, you know, and that's just the number that I can see. And I had to sit there on paper and count it out. And I knew full well that it was an aggregate amount and that mm-hmm. it's probably, the real number is probably much larger. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, there is a, there's a whole community in Peru that is getting food because mm-hmm. of him. And they don't really know it's from him. There's a whole community in Nakuru that is getting food and it's all done in his sister's name. They don't know who he is. Wow. You know, and, and and these are all things that are just coming to light. And some of the stuff I knew, a lot of it I knew, but there's a, a good number of stuff that that I didn't know he was doing. How would he become? How did he come aware of become aware of these different? Things? You know, that's the question, right? I mean, I I I, I, I at his eulogy, I I said my father is retired from mm-hmm. the tour company. But he is fully employed in the business of changing lives. Mm-hmm. 
and he was. Yeah. So the Peru one, um, you know, it just he listens. You, you know, he listens intently, and even when you think he's not listening, he still listens. Even in the mm-hmm. hospital, he heard everything we were saying. Because when I was talking to doctors about a procedure on him, his blood pressure went up, his heart rate went up. So I oh. knew he heard. I knew he heard me. <laughs> like uh, I would tell him, "Just come step outside. Let's talk outside." Um, you know. It, it'd be little things. I come back from Peru, for example, 2020 or 2021, I came back from Peru and he got wind of the fact that there was some uh, an Andean woman who'd come down and, and was trying to buy passion fruit. And that was going to be, uh, you know, oh, actually not even passion fruit, similar fruit, granadilla. And that was going to be her her food for the week for her and her baby, who she was carrying. So I I took it upon myself. I was like, you know, I didn't say anything. I was like, let me, I'll just buy her groceries for her. Because yeah. I think it's important. It was it meant something to me. And I didn't say anything. You didn't make a big production out of it. Just went and did it. Yeah. Uh, because that's what my father taught. He always said, those who say the least are the ones who do the most. It's the ones who parade around with, look what, look at me. Look what I did. Look at me. Look at me. Those are the ones you kind of have to raise your eyebrows at. Right. And, and yeah. one of our episodes in the past mm-hmm. was something my father really enjoyed. It was an episode about doing good versus being seen doing good. And, and there's yeah. a difference. Big and it was, an epi- it was an episode he inspired. Mm. You, you and I have talked about that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's powerful. Uh, wow. Yeah. I, I I don't know. You, you, you didn't meet him, but no. you knew him. Well, I, yes, I did know. I feel like I did know him because you, you are his son and you c- clearly at his knee. Mm-hmm. absorbed all the lessons and Absolutely. witnessed all of all of his heart um and and are carrying that forward and and i know for a fact taking it to your children as well so 100%. your your father 100%. and and then who knows i mean all the thousands of emails you've received of of all the other people who have have also so how can you how can anyone not know your father you know at, at that's that's I'm exactly that. right, and and that that's exactly right, you know. And it's 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 one of those things where you yeah I, I'm his reflection. I tell everybody mm-hmm. uh, I'm his reflection, right? Uh, I, I a lot of people will say that they you know they were close to their father, and they are. Uh, he was my hero. Mm-hmm. He remains my hero. Yeah. Uh, I, I I we have a saying in in our language called Bhagwan. Bhagwan means God. And mm-hmm. I was telling somebody, uh, I think it was our, our, one of our priests yesterday, I was telling him, I said, to some people, their father is, you know, an idol or, uh, you know, a, a, a role model. He was Bhagwan for me. Mm-hmm. He was like a god for me. And it wasn't because of how successful he was or anything. It was because these little things we're talking about. Because I watched him. I came back from that trip to Peru and I told him about that lady. And next thing you know, the whole village is getting support. Mm-hmm. His sister passed away and he came, he got wind of the fact that she was doing all this work that even her own family didn't know about. He wanted to carry it on because he was mm-hmm. close to her. That's that's the measure of a man. Yeah. Right? It didn't say a word. Just made it happen. Didn't say a word. So... Was the business, I don't know if I can articulate this mm-hmm. properly, was the business, Big Five Tours and Expeditions, the business that he founded put in place for the sole purpose of, be, I mean, aside from feeding your family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that's the it. prime motive it? What, like, that's, that's a great why question. did he start the business? Why? Like, was it, to, yeah. He, that's a great question, actually. So, I, I, you know, after he passed, I sat with my mom because for some months back, she had found some tattered piece of paper that had his dreams written on them. Mm, And she remembered it. And she said, look at this. She said, he checked off every one of them. She said, and, and, and the last checkoff was the business being something. And we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Mm hmm. It became something to him. It was something. I was on a stage at the World Travel Tourism Council in Rwanda, you know, giving giving commentary among some of the most powerful leaders in the world, sharing a stage with with two country presidents and a vice president. Uh, and I, you know, and he watched me become something of myself. So to, to, that was one of his visions. Now, in terms of why the business was started, that's actually a great question. So when I was talking to her. 
he, he my mother was telling me that you know because when i met your dad he wasn't an academic uh and then, so right away i looked at my wife and i go well now i know where i got that from <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i did well i did well in school i did do well in, i did do do really well in school and, and and i paid attention but i had to work hard to do well yeah. and i watched people next to me just you know it, it was natural like second nature and I would look at him, I go, now I know where it came from, at least. But yeah. he, he, his father had told him that he goes, you're not going to amount to anything. You're you're going to be, what do you say? Like, if you, if you don't get it, if you don't, in essence, in a roundabout way, if you don't work hard, you're going to be a drag on whoever you're around. <laughs> so so he, in, in a roundabout way, right? So this yeah. is, you know, old, old world, old world Indian dad. Uh, and it's saying this, right? So my father actually then, he the business wasn't his first thing right he was working as a stock boy at a hotel working at the front desk as a tony he was just learning the business even even i didn't know this apparently he even went to culinary school just to learn how the line cooks you know how they work how the kitchen wow. works so he could so he could better work with them you know in, yeah. in terms of this uh but he wanted something more and that's when the business was started and his initial intent was yeah to put food on the table it was it mm -hmm. was because it was a new idea and it was a risk and and whatnot and he wanted a challenge, but it it evolved into mm -hmm. initially him telling you know trying to get people to stop smoking on safari. <laughs> Meanwhile, mm -hmm. he was a chain smoker himself back then, oh. <laughs> uh, but trying to get people to stop smoking. He never smoked on safari, but trying to get them to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. um, he gave it up cold turkey because I asked him to. Um, this was wow. in his thirties. Did no no med, you know no no classes, no lectures, no school. Just boom done. Uh, because wow. because he made a choice um you know so there was that aspect of it and then you know and then it evolved from there and i remember when we when we, as the business was growing we had talked about uh you know he how he wanted to do good but he became very skeptical of people asking for help because he had been duped over so many times mm -hmm. where the money mm -hmm. wasn't going where it was supposed to go so he was very skeptical so I remember that there's a you know a close family friend, somebody that I call a brother. His name is Costas Christ, and uh, he he was the ambassador for our foundation for a long time, and he helped start this foundation uh, with with me, with my dad, and with uh, Deborah Pilcalls, who used to work here. Um, she retired, and as and and I remember when we started the foundation, he was kind of like, well, what do we do with it? And it was these measured projects in different places and whatnot. And I think when we did that, he started opening his eyes. And started mm. seeing all the the work that needed to be done, all the help that that was needed, and it was just all across the board. And then he made a choice. He said, "If somebody does things the wrong way, if somebody is less than honest about what we're doing, we'll hold them accountable. We will find we'll hold them accountable." But he made a decision, and he didn't share, but he just internally, just his actions spoke about it, was that he was willing to take the chance of being betrayed. Because he knew that the reward was much greater. He, you know, we we had a school in Kibera that the headmaster was stealing money. He had to close the school and he felt betrayed, but he wasn't the end of it. We had, you know, another school in Tanzania that grew and had graduated and it was it was a completed project. Uh, but then, you know, then he started seeing the politics were getting involved and he wanted to get out. And he started, he felt betrayed again. But he still always felt that the greater good was worth the risk of betrayal in life and in the foundation right he yeah. felt that um and he was just I, I i didn't know this but he's been he one of the things an example a long time ago he talked about uh, delivering supplies and aid for people in india who need eye surgeries mm -hmm. um, and it was something early on it was before the foundation it was something that he was doing on the side and 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 then all of a sudden i when i was going through his stuff after he passed he's been doing it ever since Wow, just didn't really? tell anybody he's been funding this ever since out of his own pocket to make sure that people in india who needed any kind of eye surgery from cataracts to to, to outpatient surgery and they couldn't afford it that he was able to do it to give them vision in, in wow. random parts i mean how do you you know how do you summarize that right i mean yeah he, he was he was the vision behind this and you start hearing this and i was just telling my mom this morning i said you know, the amount of respect he had was already tremendous. But when you start seeing all these stories coming out about him, the level of respect he has just keeps going up. Yeah. And the 
And the ironic thing is that if this had all come out when he was alive, it wouldn't have had the same impact. Would he have been able to even own all of that? You know, it sounds like he was very humble. Would he even have been able to handle receiving no. the, the accolades and the admiration? Quite, quite honestly, would have pissed him off. <laughs> quite honestly you know he did, doesn't like the day he doesn't didn't like it he doesn't want that kind of attention he that that project in nakuru uh and they still don't know it's him because they don't listen to this podcast uh but but uh you know and 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 that was what was really really cool was the fact that 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 particular part of nakuru he told them it's god doing it he made them promise that it was that it was coming for him, that 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 he made whoever was doing it something that don't don't tell him where it came from. It wow. was a con it was a condition upon mm -hmm. his aid. It was a condition. And why? That, why didn't he want people to know? I mean, well, other than the hu the hu the humility, the hu being humble that way, you know. I asked I asked him that. Yeah. Um and his answer was pretty profound. Um I didn't think so at the time, but it is definitely now. So he he thought a lot about the about how we came to the U.S. and and what it took to get here and what it took to stay here. Um, he even remembered the moments where we lost everything, where mm. you know when I was a teenager, where we lost everything, and you know he didn't have a penny to his name. I remember you know moving to New York City when we first came to the U.S. and him not even having enough money to buy two sets of French fries at a McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And he pretended to eat his already and sat there and watched me eat mine. And you and I have talked about this, yeah. um, you yeah. know, and, and I remember that. And, and he brought that up. He said, I couldn't even buy you ice cream. I couldn't even buy French fries. He said, if not for the Thorne family, when we first moved to the U.S., we wouldn't have even had a house or an apartment. We mm. were, we were rent, you know, the, the company was running out of a one room in an office. We were staying in their apartment till we found our own. Then we had, you know, we had uh, my, my mother's uncle who was helping us uh, to get settled and whatnot. He talked about all these things. And then he talked about how it all went away and how, you know, he was made to feel like a failure by people who were supposed to lift him up. Mm -hmm. and, and instead it was that. And then the same people that, that, that made him feel like a failure showed up and started with their hand out asking for everything when he made something of himself. And he doled it out. He he gave it without asking asking questions. And he said, his his exact words to me. Well, I shouldn't say exact words because he was, <laughs> to, 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 you know, he the conversation with him was done when he said it was done, which is usually pretty quick of me. Oh, he didn't. <laughs> he, he didn't like. He would say something and then walk away because the conversation was done. Uh. And, and, and it wasn't <laughs> until later I realized he just didn't want to talk about it because it was it was painful. Um, oh, so, yeah. so he, what he told me was, we've been on the receiving end of this. We, we came mm -hmm. to New York. We didn't know anybody. We knew a couple of contexts, if not for people like the Bombay family or people like the Thorn family or, you know, my, my, my mother's family, her, her uncle or whatnot. I don't know that we would have actually even made it. We, we'd probably be back in Kenya. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that we would have actually made it. Um, uh, and, and he talked about the fact that we've been on the receiving end. And he said, I know what it looks, I know what it feels like to be overlooked. Wow. I know what it feels like to to just not to not be seen. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what, and this was a conversation we had, gosh, 2014, 15, right around there. Uh, we actually know 2016. It was 2016 because we won a sustainability award from from a large consortium, and it was the only time in my life we've been on stage together. Oh, it was the only time in my life that I've actually won something, and he was there. Usually, he was traveling, working, doing whatever, uh, and he wasn't there. It was the only time in my life that he was actually there to see me win something, and not only that, was on stage with me. Um, and it only time since, so it only happened once, and mm -hmm. and and he he referenced that, and so it was, it was 2016. We talked about that, and he said. We've been on the receiving end. He said, mm -hmm. we've been on the other side of this. Uh, and it's important. To yeah. him, he said, it's important. He, he often talked about remembering where you came from. And talked about remembering where you came from, how we came from, and, and, and everything else. So that was that was the, 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 that was the key uh, in, in terms of it. So um, 
there's there you know i to, to your to your question i don't think he would have run from the spotlight he would he would have run from it he wouldn't have wanted it he would have said why he would have said what's the point and then he would ask me is this about you or them that's what he would ask me yeah so i thought it was pretty fitting um i thought it was pretty funny fitting that um uh, that we actually talked about him on this mm -hmm. on this on this episode because yeah. you know again it's i haven't i don't think i've reached every single number of the people he's impacted it's the little thing so mm -hmm. i i was telling i was telling some people in our community here i said you know you know, they were talking like one of them was talking about sports and college basketball. And he says, Oh, your your father talking about college basketball all the time. I said, he didn't know a thing about college basketball. You know, he never went to college. I was the first one to go to college in our family. He never went to college. So he didn't know a thing about college basketball. He knew about Arizona basketball because I told him about it. <laughs> Yet he would pretend to know about college basketball and March Madness because he valued their relationship so much. Mm. that he wanted to, to he wanted to to connect on he would connect with you at your level meaning on your topic he would connect with you on your terms and this is such a unique quality because there are a lot of people in this world who will force you to connect with them on their terms mm -hmm. right i don't like phone calls i only do email i don't uh -huh. like email i only do phone calls uh message me dm me let's talk about this i, I i'm not into cars i'm into this i'm not into this i'm into that you never heard that out of him. I would put on a Formula One race because he knew I was a car jockey and he would watch with me. And then he would yeah. ask me, he asked me questions and whatnot. And, and this was important because it parlayed into how he helped people as well. Uh, he would talk to our, 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 you know, to people he met on the ground in different countries. And if, some, if somebody needed a car or somebody needed something, he would ask, like, okay, do you need this part? Do you need that part? Do you need this? How do you, how can I help you? Do you need this? He would have parts shipped to his house just to help somebody out because they couldn't get it somewhere else and whatnot. And no. that's the whole point. He had an antique car at one point. It was the car that, that we used during my marriage, my wedding. He donated it to a museum and said, here, it's a, it was a 1931 Ford Model A. And he donated it to a museum. And it wasn't because he wanted credit or, or he wanted to have vanity, but he, the mechanic that was taking care of the car passed away. And he couldn't in good conscience keep the car, knowing that somebody else is going to be touching it. So he gave it to a museum in honor of that mechanic. Wow. Um, that, that's, the, that's there. That's the, so cool. It, it, it's, I'm telling you. Um, you know, it, when I talked to my mother about this and when I told her about the 103,000, she said, she said to me, she goes, you should probably add another zero to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, you think about people passing in their legacy and all of that. And, and surely he had dreams and expectations for his children. And, um, so fill in a blank for me because you, did he have expectations that you were going oh God, into the yeah. family business or no. He didn't, mm -hmm. right? So how did that all come about? Because I feel like that's part of his legacy and the ability to carry on is where you mm -hmm. are now with everything. He told me at an earlier age, very early age, he said, you do whatever you want to do. I was like 15, 16. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, and he said, do whatever you want to do. When I got accepted to university, I, I went to him. I said to him, "Look, I I was an AutoCAD since I was fourteen. I was designing cars. I was my love, my my passion was cars. It turned into finance later on, but my passion was cars. And I said, I don't want to be in this business." He said, "Good, go, go, good, go, go, follow your dreams." And I went clear across the country to Arizona, um, and you know, and it was. Uh, how we even afforded school between me getting a job and high interest credit card loans and everything else is beyond me uh, because it, it was out of state, everything else. But I went clear across the country. And I remember the day I left, I was emotional. I was hugging my mom. I was saying goodbye uh, before I flew out there. And I, she said, she said to me, if you want to just change your mind and stay. And my father runs, he goes, oh. absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, you need to go out there. And what he was trying to tell me was he did as much as I didn't want to be in his shadow and I want him identity. He wanted that even more for me. Mm. He wanted me to have my own name, my own identity. And that was his, that was his expectation. Yeah. It was.
it was that that I that I beca- I was able to stand my own stand on my own two feet. So he wanted me by be to be me to be my own person. He wanted me to have my own identity. He he knew very early on before anybody else did, before I did, my mother did, anybody else did, that I was going to have to answer some difficult questions later on in life about being his son. And what I mean by that is a sense of entitlement, mm. a sense that 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 you know that because I'm his son, I should apologize because, for what uh, for being his son for for you know, people would assume that I had a silver spoon in my mouth, which I didn't uh, because my parents had nothing on that spoon. It was mm-hmm. silver, but it was empty. <laughs> there yeah, was nothing yeah. on it. Uh, he knew early on that that was, that was going to be a problem. So he wanted me to go. He, fl- I remember he flew out with me to Arizona and he, he came in and he goes, this looks great. This looks fantastic. I think he left really quickly. Uh, as soon as he did. And and, and I remember, uh, you know, he, he came to visit, uh, you know, he came to check in. I ended up getting sick. He came, he, you know, I was in the hospital for a bit there. He came to visit. Actually, no, he didn't. My mother came to visit. He came afterwards to see. And he, he came to watch homecoming football games to see us get rocked. Um, <laughs> you know, he came to see that. But he yeah. never once asked me, how are you doing? And it's not that he didn't care. Yeah. He didn't want to ask because he knew that if the answer was that I wasn't doing well, it might open the door for me to come back. So he purposely didn't ask. And I'm glad he did. Yeah. I'm really glad he didn't. I remember, I remember, uh, so we, we used to, well, I can say it's on the podcast now. It's all right. Cause I'm old enough to say this. Uh, <laughs> I, I used to, we, when we were in university, we used to drive across the border to Mexico to go to the bars. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, everybody did. We were one hour from the border. As I was you always, do, as you do when you're a college student. <laughs> seeing as my father likely is still listening to me from the afterlife, I can tell him that I was a designated driver the whole time. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, and I was, uh, yeah. because I was the only one who spoke Spanish. So I was. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and it was funny because I had a green card. I'm not a U.S. citizen, and I spoke Spanish. So I'm like, oh, this is going to go well. <laughs> so, That's so, so we, uh, he never asked me, but mm-hmm. I remember the conversation I had with him. It was a junior, I was a junior in university. It was my third year. I was 20 years old. Um, and one of, one of our friends, <clears throat> she had gone with some of her friends, gone down to Mexico to Nogales to go drinking. And her designated driver on the way back flipped the car. Uh, and she was paralyzed from the waist down because of the accident. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt. She was uh, sleeping in the back seat. And I went to go see her in the hospital, and it shook me uh, because this person was, you know, one of the most popular girls in school. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden, she's paralyzed. And I remember I called, and and I was on that same road, right? I mean, I wasn't driving mm-hmm. with her. I was a different time, different day, but I was taking that road all the time. And it shook me and I was telling him what happened. And my mother was like, well, are you okay? And and, and my father would quickly quiet her down and then say, okay, did you, were you driving? That was his concern. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I wasn't driving. It was a different car. I have no, I, I were okay. Yeah. So then he asked, okay, you know, what what happened? How's this? Everything else? And then this next question, next question he asked me was, "Have you done everything you can to help her?" But she came from a nice family, so they were taking care of her. But he asked me, mm-hmm. "Have you done everything you can to help her?" Because her life was changed, obviously forever at yeah. that point. Uh, but that was his concern. Yeah. His concern was was not how I was in terms of emotionally. His concern was, "Did you do everything to that poor to to help that poor woman as much as you could?" She was your friend. Were you a friend to her? That was his yeah. concern, right? He didn't care about anything else. He didn't. He didn't even care that I went to Mexico, or that I was out yeah. all night. He, he was like, okay, um, you know. So I mean, I think that was that was the one time I called him. And then so, there was another time where somebody had, you know, I set my apartment on fire. <laughs> oh Lord! Uh, <laughs> I set my apartment on fire trying to saute onions to impress a girl, and that didn't go so well. Um, and so I, you know, I had to put the fire out and everything. So, Again, he didn't care if I was okay. Well, I'm sure he did, but he didn't ask. Mm-hmm. But it was there. The only time that he actually genuinely was scared, I went hiking at Mount Lemon in Tucson um, with my best friend, who's still my best friend today. And I got lost for multiple days mm. on Mount Lemon. And we had 
four bottles of water and a roll of breath mints. And that's all we had over multiple days. To, and he didn't know where I was. I didn't tell him I was going. I told my roommate who didn't tell him. So he was worried. So he was getting ready to call the police at this mm. point. And this, is, and this is the guy who, you know, when it came to safety apparatus, when it came to safety items, he would panic pretty quickly, right? He wouldn't panic yeah. in life. But when it came to safety, he wouldn't panic. Um, I, I remember my freshman year of university, I'd come home and I snuck out to go skydiving. I didn't tell anybody. I just went. Um, I was 18, so I could have to ask me. I was like, my liberating moment. I went, people, people sometimes liberating moment go vote. I went skydiving. Wow. So, and I ended up tearing my Achilles on the landing, uh, rushing, <laughs> re, re tearing it on the landing. Yeah. And when I came back, my father goes, you did what? How could you be so stupid? And how could you be so crazy? And da, da, da. my mother saw the video and she goes, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, uh, so I looked, at, I looked at him and said, all right, now I know where I got that part from. Yeah, I was so, going to say the same. So your yeah, mother's the risk taker. Absolutely. I see. I absolutely. So, 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 to, so the long answer is just that. And then 9-11 happened. Um, and our company was going through the financial firm I was working with, they were going through layoffs and I wasn't mm -hmm. getting laid off and their severance package included an MBA. So I was volunteering. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I would go and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. I'm like, please let me go. And they wouldn't do it. And I just was just completely disillusioned. Mm -hmm. I wasn't asking him and he contacted me and he said, look, there's some circumstances that are, that are happening here, but there's one that could allow for an opening, but you got to, you know, work. And you're going to be on the ground because I, was, I literally started in the mail room as a teenager. So I knew the business from that side. Yeah. But he said, there's this part. I could use your help here. And I wasn't sure um, because of what he was always worried about, the silver spoon thing. He was always worried about that. So I wasn't sure. And and I kept thinking that if I came back to the family business, that it would mean that I couldn't make it on my own. Mm, really? I, really? I, I thought that. I thought that. Um, and he, huh. he, you know, he didn't. I thought that. Yeah. So we went to India for about a month. We went to India, just me and him, for about a month. Mm -hmm. And we just went all over the country and just started just talking. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing all these things that could be done to make the world better. And I started talking to him about using travel as a, for lack of better words, a force for good. Yeah. Right. The, the fact that there is so, there's so much that can be done to better what's happening in the world. And and we, we can be a conduit for it. That, that, perked his ears that was 2002 january 2002 that that perked his ears wow. and then right around um you know right around the middle of the, the middle of that decade when we started the foundation um you know and, and, and kind of oh. just really really coming into our own uh, mm -hmm. in terms in terms of what we do and how we do it so his the coming me joining the family business was not something he expected it was something that literally the universe just aligned Wow. Um, and, See, and, and I it, would just say inevitable. It, yeah. That it, that, it was, yeah. Uh, that it was inevitable, but I just wondered the if thing. there was ever that expectation. My mother said the same thing. She said it was, it yeah. said it was inevitable. It, to him, no. And, 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 and to I, neither I, of you. Wow. No, no. And I don't have the expectation. Of, in fact, with, with my kids, I have told both my kids that there isn't a job here for you. You need to make sure you go out and do something. And both of them are doing something. Certain. And, and I said the same thing my father said. I said, the universe allows for it, then maybe. But mm -hmm. you shouldn't have any expectations because he didn't. You know, mm -hmm. he he did. Family businesses are not easy. They're, they're no. challenging. They're difficult. They're emotional. They're everything. And ours was charged to the nth degree mm -hmm. uh, because there was family involved um, even before I got here. And it was just... It, it was it was going sideways fast um, yeah. and, and through no fault of his own um, and he just you know it, it was just that but his most important thing was that he made something of himself um, I remember our 50th anniversary he said something our 50th anniversary during his talk and God, you should have seen the smile on his face it was a oh. smile that nobody was going to take away right and, yeah. and this is a man who every other moment in his life and this is part of the humility Whenever, and he said this to me, whenever he smiled, he was always worried that the other shoe was about to drop, that it was temporary. Really? Yeah. He lost, you know, I mean, his his parents both lost both of his parents. Then he basically, you know, I mean, a bunch of stuff happened with the, with the family after, you know, that was, you know, had just caused drama and everything else and whatnot. And I just kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. And, mm. and and the 50th anniversary was when he was just happy 
yeah. happy, like inside you could see his heart. And apparently that was his last drink. The that last the, check on the That was the, the last list. check. Yeah, that wow. was the last check. And so he, because he, one, one of the, he, two, two things on that, the, there were four things of, the, of those four things, the two the room that stood out the most to me. He wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, the company to be something and the name to mean something. And then he wanted to be a good provider. He wanted yeah. to be a good father and he was gone a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but he wanted to be a good father. He desperately wanted to be a good father and he didn't even know it, but he didn't become my father. He became my hero. Yeah. But did He didn't even know. And I told him, I, I, I told him, I remember when I graduated college, I had gone to him and I said, you know, people go around looking for mentors. I said, you've been my, my whole life. And I got to say that to him. Last year, after I got to stage in Rwanda, um, I called him and I was very emotional because it was a huge moment. I called mm -hmm. him and I said, this was for you. I said, I wanted you to see me make something of myself. Mm -hmm. And that was that. And then our 50th anniversary party, I didn't even tell him we were planning it. I just did it, told him we to be there. And I planned the whole thing. I didn't want anybody else involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they got there, we were showing videos. We found pictures of their my parents' wedding day, of the first Aww. tour bus we had, of the of the office. I mean, just everything. And he said to me, exact words. He said, "My parents are here. My Aww. parents are here." They're, he's never said that in his life. When we built our office yeah. building, he said to me in the car, "I wish my father was here to see this because yeah. that was one of his dreams to have an office building." So he said, "I wish my father was here to see this." So there's a plaque actually outside our our door that has his parents' name on it. Now we're going to be putting up a plaque with his name on it. Um, and and what's amazing was with his parents, none of us knew them. knew them obviously he did, and he knew them only for twenty years or less than twenty years. So yeah, there was there was very little to choose from in terms of what to say. I'm having trouble figuring out what to say on his plaque because mm. there's so much so material. much I, to say how do you <laughs> how do you choose how do you uh, distill? yeah i will read to you his last note that he wrote he wrote a note every thursday for our staff meetings oh and he would read it off to the team and this was the last note he wrote excellence is never an accident it is always the result of high intention sincere effort and intelligent execution isn't that what goes on his plaque? Can't fit. It's too oh. long. <laughs> it's too that's, long. That's amazing. And what right. a what a what a what a wonderful tradition. I um can we transition into you telling me you said you were yeah. going to talk about your hair, but oh, yeah. let's, let's I'm, talk about I'm it. curious about are you comfortable telling me a little bit about your your yeah, I don't even yeah. want to call them rituals. I don't know if that's the right word. No, ritual is the right word. In I your mean, in your religion, how does one process and honor death and passing, or what is it even called? Everybody does it differently, but but Hindus in general believe that the that the body is just a vessel, mm -hmm. right? That's why if you go to places like Varanasi, when somebody passes away, the body is not treated very well. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's a vessel. Um, so we we cremate because we believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll actually be going to to India later on this year to spread dad's ashes over the Ganges because that's where uh -huh. it needs to go. Yeah. Um, and dad's dad's ashes are not going to the Ganges in Varanasi. Uh, when he was when I was younger, my 20s, he had gone to India with my mother and they were supposed to go to India be before this injury happened. They were they were actually supposed to leave about two weeks after uh, I got back um, and they never got to make it uh, because of his injury. But. Up in Haridwar, which is near the Himalayas, the foothills of the Himalayas, he had gone there many years ago, and he actually slipped and fell down all these concrete stairs and into the Ganges. Not a scratch on him. Not wow. a scratch on him. And so his ashes are going to go back there to the exact spot where he, where he actually entered the Ganges. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll be doing that later on this year. So... For us, the you know, and for for us, and each each look, you know, Indians are like economists. You talk to ten of them, you get ten different answers uh, when it comes to rituals. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. so for us, it's reincarnation, right? So his soul is freed with the cremation. However, this what we did right here with our hair. Um, this is the last part, and actually, it should be completely down to the skin. But I have to travel; I can't go all the way to. I've got to yeah. make it somewhat, somewhat there. So. Um, you're basically letting go of your last roots 
Okay. You're letting go of your last connection with him to free him. That mm -hmm. we're we're mourning his loss, right? We miss him. We're mourning his loss. We're we're shaving your head is is way of telling the world that I am mourning this person being gone. But it also means that I am freeing him from this life, and so that he can go to the next, wow. and that we'll see each other in the next life. And and I see his mannerisms in my son every single day. Mm -hmm. I see his mannerisms in my dog every single day. Um, but this what this is for. Um, mm. you know, so, so while he was for the 13 days, we had a, 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 a what we call the diva, which is like a little a flame that was, it was, it was, it was lit and it was basically, yeah. a, 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 it never went out for 13 days. Uh, it was lit the whole time. So, um, you know, and that's the, that's the main thing that it was there. Mm -hmm. Um, and while that was going on, I couldn't shave you, I couldn't do anything. So I had a crappy beard, I had, I had an Afro, I had everything. Yeah. Uh, but now then once it comes in, everything has to come off, um, you know, and, and this is how you, how you, you honor him. Okay. Um, so that was, yeah, so that's essentially it. So uh, as a Hindu, so in fact, the, we have a ceremony tonight um, at our temple. Mm -hmm. This is the last place he was at before he got hurt. Really? Friday, Friday morning, March 1st is where he, where he fell. Um, Thursday night, the last outing he had was to this temple. So the people that we are with tonight are the last people to see him as mm -hmm. you know before before he fell. I wow. saw him for a split second on Friday that Friday morning because I just said good morning to him. They actually had all evening with him, and I'm listening to some of these conversations. He wasn't saying goodbye to anybody. He was just having a normal evening. But when I hear some of the things he was saying, it was almost like the universe knew his time was coming. Yeah. And so some of the things he said, he didn't know what he was saying them or he didn't know what it meant. But you look at the meaning yeah. of them now and it sure sounds like goodbyes to me, uh, <sighs> yeah. you, you know, in, in terms of it. So, yeah, it, 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 so, so the ritual tonight is like a spiritual send off, um, you know, in, in terms of in terms of what that what that means. Um, it, it, it's that. And, and, and we have his favorite music. We have his favorite food, um, you know, that, that that's there. And, and his favorite food was? Oh, he loved Indian food, but it was like paneer or stuff like that. Uh, so it was like, it was, yeah. I mean, he loved all, he loved all food. He yeah. wasn't a big eater, but when he ate, he enjoyed food. He enjoyed wine. But this place, the food that's made at the temple, he's eating, the, even the priest goes, he goes, oh, your dad ate this food. I said, we're not getting the food from there then. We'll get it from somewhere oh. else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was there. Um, he, he got to actually, you know, it's funny because I was just this morning, I was thinking about this morning. I said, you know, he got to become something. He got to make yeah. something of his life. He got to become something. And all the accolades and adulation he's getting right now, as I, as I told you, it wouldn't have happened if he was, if he was around it because he wouldn't have accepted. He has right. no choice. He has no choice now. Uh, right. To, but, but to accept it. And it's pretty powerful when you see what people think of him and it makes mm -hmm. you proud as a, as a, as a son, it makes you really, really proud. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah we sure. we have gone grossly over time haven't we We have i i haven't i've been looking at the clock every now and then but today is a special episode and it doesn't matter so we're just we're just Rather. rolling with it here i have i told you i loved you oh <laughs> my friend listen let me tell you how your just your father's heart extending through you has affected me oh god so okay. um when the pandemic hit, as you know, um, just every, the world stopped. And what I do is dependent on people traveling and marketing and all of that. So with nothing to sell, there's no, um, no work for me, right. um, to help facilitate that. And you, I, I'm had, you know, the sole focus on keeping all of your people employed and by mm -hmm. virtue of that, we're able to keep me employed. And I am forever grateful. And I am not joking when I tell you that the work that I was able to do for you during that period of time, not only saved me mentally, but also just financially, just to wow. be able to, you know, keep moving forward. Um, I, it's just with my deepest gratitude that wow. I, you know... I will be forever grateful to you for that and, right. and filled with love for you for that. And I know it's because your father taught you he taught that me this what, is how hey. we 
This is I how we learned. treat other people. So huh. when your day comes, and it will probably be even more millions because <laughs> it will grow exponentially from from where your father, from the seed your father planted, I will be one of one of the millions that that you oh. have touched. I so. this means everything. I had no idea. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. This is thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. He, thank uh, you. You're right. It's it, it was him because he, when I told him about it, he he never you know he was he's always the person that I would have to convince to do something. Mm. So I'm really really happy you said that. That's yeah. those are the conversations I've been having. Those are the conversations I've been having with everybody about how they changed his life, what they did. And it's the true measure of a man. Yeah. And I and and I remember my my legacy that I leave for my kids is I told them is that they never have to apologize for what their last name is. And mm. apparently his legacy was the same because I don't have to apologize once no. for who he was. I, I I get to take credit for all of his work because he's not here taken. And I'm in the same boat. I don't like taking credit. I don't like yeah. the attention that uh, <laughs> he, you know, it just it's not not what we do it for uh well we, yeah. yeah when you we um stars. yeah and you know you um people could take that so many different ways but that's a that's a lot for you to 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 continue to absorb and receive and and right. learn about your father and then to figure out how you move f forward with that and you know it's it's impressive to me you know many people could not everyone would do what you're doing, which is, you know, honoring him and, and, and moving yeah. forward on your own, but also with him alongside. So well, with him we're alongside. all better for it. Absolutely. Right. And I, I think it, you, I told you, right. March 16th is the day of his passing every year from now on. March 16th is going to be a day of service for the company worldwide uh, every year, every year. I mean, we do so much beyond that. But this is the, the, I tell everybody, I get asked, how do I honor your father? How do I make, mm -hmm. do I make a donation? No, go do something, go help somebody. Don't go close your wall, put your wallet away, open your hands, go get to work, go to a yeah. shelter, go on the road, go pick up something, go, go do something physically to help people. Um, we still got a record number of donations coming to the foundation in his name, which is amazing. It's an honor mm -hmm. uh, to, to do it. It really is. Uh, but I tell anybody who, who wants to honor my uh, head, if you want to honor him, go do something, go help somebody in need. He called them the voiceless. Go give him a voice. Mm -hmm. That's how you honor him. Yeah. This was amazing. This was, this was, this was cathartic. <laughs> this was great. good. Well, thank uh, you for sharing him. It takes, it takes, um, a lot of courage and you've got a big night tonight um but thank you for taking time to to tell us all about your father absolutely thank you for allowing for it you're the you're the best co-host ever ah. <laughs> this is the, this is this is this is special um we'll we'll get back to 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 uh, you know to knocking down tourist boards and and, and political employees next week but this, this oh one yeah was special this yeah. one was special <laughs> yeah this was great terrific oh. all right well my my blessing my thank my you. wish for just all the blessings in the world for you, you. and your family and just continued um continued great stories which will probably continue your whole life you'll continue to be surprised and amazed by your I, he's he's walking alongside me the whole time so he's either great stories or playing practical jokes on me well one or two things is always going to be happening <laughs> yeah. well i want to hear about all of them so. oh next time i'll play there's a bunch that have already happened awesome. i kind of i kind of just look up and go really <laughs> so, <laughs> that's awesome so okay, all right my i appreciate it thank you again I have a, we'll see the next episode, guys, uh, anybody, the, the, our listeners, uh, next episode will be, what are we talking about? We're going back to Colombia next well, episode. Well, I think we're going to go back to Colombia. We didn't talk about Med Medellin yet. No, nope. so we're think... going to be going into Medellin and Antioquia and the whole, the whole mountain regions of, of Colombia and the Alpar. So looking forward to that. It'll awesome. be great. All okay. right. Take Until care, next everybody. Time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Sustainable Voice. If you have a success story of your own, please reach out and share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time.